Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I've known about Dr. Thomas Teske for a while. Back in 2014, when I was first researching navicular issues, I came across his ideas on the connection between teeth and the hoof. He talked about how the wear patterns of the hoof and of teeth have certain correlations, and he often saw improvements in hoof wear and movement when the teeth, specifically the incisors or front teeth, were properly balanced. This made sense to me, since if the horse didn't have full range of motion of the head because of tooth discomfort, I'm sure their movement wouldn't be as fluid as possible either. In 2020, I got a copy of his book, Insight to Equus, which prompted me to reach out to Dr. Teske and see if he'd answer some questions about dental care for horses and how it affects movement and soundness. Why don't we start with, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you went from being, you know, a general veterinarian to becoming more interested in hoof care and dentistry? Yeah, yeah. I was uh, started being a veterinarian in 1995 uh, after I left Colorado State University. I came back to Arizona and I thought I'm going to go be a veterinarian for big herds of beef cows cuz in my background I come from a ranching type family. We always had cows and horses around and I thought that's that's what I want to do. So I headed down to southeast Arizona where some of the biggest cow herds in the state are. And within two years of that, the cattle market totally hit a bottom. And all of a sudden the ranchers were not calling. They they just couldn't afford it, you know. If they had a sick cow, they would just do what they could to see if she survived. And they certainly weren't going to spend any extra money because she wasn't worth it. So I thought, oh, no, I have a young family. I have debts to pay off from my education of a quarter million dollars. And I was a little bit uh, concerned. So I thought, well, there are people with horses around here, too. So. I guess I could probably go see a horse, you know, I, it's not my preference, but I'll see how it goes. And wow, after just a few months and, and also making a little bit of money, which was nice. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. These equine medicine and equine hoof care and dental care was starting to interest me more. So I started looking at it more and then it took about five years. I would say it was right around the year 2000 that well, I kind of settled down from, you know, the stress of school and a young family and kind of got into my groove and kind of had some breathing room. You know, I was like, finally had a chance to just enjoy the landscape a little bit and take a few big breaths. And I, and I started to realize a few things that, wow, I'm, uh, I'm seeing some of these same horses for the same problems every season or maybe every month, or maybe certainly every every few months, uh, uh, a couple times a year. For example, horses that were consistently colicky or lame or had certain allergies or always seemed to get weird skin problems. And I just noticed that it kept coming back, coming back. And I thought, huh, I thought we fixed that. I thought we had dealt with that. You know, we did everything we're supposed to do. I I gave the right shots. I gave the right pills. I even consulted with some of my professors on some cases of lameness and whatnot, because I was like, oh, we got to figure this out. This is important. I, I can remember being on the phone with old teachers and, and colleagues about, hey, what do you do for this or that? And they said, well, what did you do? And I told them everything I did, the x-rays, the lameness check, the special injections. And they thought, huh, well, that's what I do. I thought, "Uh uh-huh, okay, so you have the same issues that I'm having. They said, oh, yeah, that's that's how that is. Like, oh. And I thought, well, I didn't like that. I thought, that's not a cure, right? That was was a cover-up. Oh, I'm kind of a personality type that doesn't, how you say, I'm not satisfied with just the standard traditional 
answer to this or that. I'm I'm pretty annoying sometimes when I'm I'm asking questions or now I try not to be, but and I, I think I've learned how to be a little bit more politically correct if that's if I'm allowed to say that as far as I ask more questions that hopefully will get people to consider what they're doing without telling them they're doing something wrong. I I learned that 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 was important because I certainly didn't like to be told that I was doing something wrong. So a lot of it turned into how do I handle the human psychology part of helping these animals. I, I couldn't help the animals at all if I couldn't reach their owner, right? I had to I had to get into their head and heart space if I was going to be successful uh, trying to help their animals. And so it, it didn't take long. The hoof care part was the big thing with getting me really out of that box of, oh, we, okay, we use this special shoe for this. We use this special injection for this. And... It was just endless. I mean, I had whole textbooks on special shoeing, special farrier skills. I, I was an accomplished farrier myself, could easily prescribe and, and place special shoes and rim pads, wedge pads, aluminum, egg bars, you name it. I knew how to do all that. Wow. Within a couple of years after starting to look at why that wasn't working, I was like, okay, the jig is up. The, the cat's out of the bag. I I started to try some other things, and wow, I was helping horses that were previously dead at my hands. I mean, this, this was absolutely life and death. I Instead of drawing up the euthanasia solution, I was pulling out my management and husbandry skills that were turning these horses around, say from like cases of founder, cases of metabolic problems. I mean, totally turn them around. So that really impressed me that that was possible. And it kept going from there. I, I really grabbed that and took that and kept going with that. That's that's kind of the short part of that story of how I got started in, in that line of work. Yeah, that's really interesting. I actually had no idea that you used to do more traditional shoeing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, I could ask you a million questions and we could talk probably for hours about a bunch of topics, but um, mm -hmm. I was hoping we could focus on the dental and hoof correlation today, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Sure. But I guess the basis for this, like kind of getting people who have no idea anything about dental work. I mean, I didn't know anything until, you know, webinars on more of like a natural balance type approach to dentistry because it affects the hoof so much. Um, mm -hmm. But before that, I had no idea that, you know, I just paid someone, whatever, $75 to come out and take what looked like a big file and shove it in my horse's mouth and rasp a little bit and then leave. Um, mm -hmm. So first, I guess a very basic question is like, why do we even have somebody come out and mess with our horse's mouth if, you know, wild horses obviously don't have anybody sticking anything in their mouth? And what is incisor work anyway? Like, what what is this topic that we're even approaching in terms right. of dentistry? Yeah. Yeah, great, uh, great question, and it'll it'll open up a whole box of adventures for us to <laughs> to to start looking at that question. I think with your audience, I also appreciate that there's a lot of people interested in hoof care, right? Yeah. And so let's help everybody kind of get into this headspace and heart space around that question about why are we even looking at that? Because most people, and you understand that horses, domestic horses, horses in captivity, even horses that are on track systems or horses that are in work, their hooves are not 100% self-trimming, right? Okay. They have parts of their hooves that are starting to look like they're self-trimming. For example, breakover, you look at a toe that is very nicely polished and rounded, uh, has a really nice bevel or mustang roll, as we call it. And then you look at, oh, wow, look at this heel balance. It's really nice. And this this heel angle. And and then, um, oh, there's a sole layer here. There's a, a loose piece of frog. This quarter is kind of busted out right here. But when you as a trimmer are looking at that and you say, wow, I can see where this horse is doing something on their own. That makes my job so much easier because I'm just going to take my tools and finish that whatever the horse started. And 
I think it's very cool and it's very nice to have some of those cues available on the hoof and take it from there. So think about that uh, when you're looking at a horse hoof. And now we start to look at the way the horse is chewing and the way the horse is picking up their food. And then we actually get to the point where we're going to part their lips and take a quick peek at their incisors, their front teeth. And we will see a couple of main things that are going to help us determine if they are self-maintaining or not. Now, when you have a horse that is not totally self-maintaining their feet, you trim them. When you have a horse that is not grazing high desert pasture 18 hours per day, tearing away at brush and dry grass and the occasional rock or the occasional mineral that they're scraping off the ground, this sort of thing, what are the chances that their incisor is going to look a little bit different than a horse that I could show you off of my landscape here? You think there might be a difference? Sure. There's a huge difference in the way their feet look too, right? I can show you uh, horses off the desert with polished, calloused feet, and I can part the lips and take a picture of some horses right now and send them to you, and you could compare those teeth pictures to horses that never get the opportunity to graze. This is the crux of the issue right here. How much grazing, how much head down 18 hours a day nibbling around, browsing, grazing, choosing this, choosing that, does your horse herd do? And beyond that, what is it that they're grazing? Because a lot of people do have grazing available, but it's this, it's this green color. And <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, being a little, I'm being a little bit facetious here because the only green I ever see is a couple times a year when it rains here. Mostly what horses have evolved eating and following the landscape changes season to season is more mature type grasses. Uh, they could never stay in one place very long because the predators would make sure of that. You better move on or I'm going to eat you up. And horses love to explore and travel too. They're very curious about what's over that mountain. And anyway, horses that are grazing the green stuff that I see, they kind of have this process started it's kind of like looking at a domestic horse on a track that oh they're starting to roll their toe or, or wear that quarter out nicely and we can finish that easily now if i look at horses that are on a little bit of grazing opportunity not high desert but a little bit i'm like yeah you can see where this incisor wear is starting to look appropriate and if they don't have that wow then i can start to point out okay Look at this, 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 and this. Do you see this angle? Do you see this length? Do you see this incisor gap or this, what we call an incisor, uh, most people call them incisor hooks. These are some of the things that easily can pick up on and you start to wonder, well, how come those exist in domestic non-grazing horses? And we don't see that in horses that are self-maintaining. When you understand that, you can start to understand why we get very interested in helping horses maintain their front teeth. It's, it's very much in line with why we would want to trim their feet uh, to keep them in balance because they're constantly growing. Many people don't realize that horses' teeth and most herbivores with their teeth are called hypsodont teeth and they have huge amount of reserve crown up inside their skull. If you x-ray a young horse, you'll see teeth that are five to six inches long up inside their head. And if you x-ray a horse that's 20 years old, you'll see a tooth that's down to two inches or less in length because over time, it's erupting and wearing down, erupting and wearing down approximately two to three millimeters every year. So you have to realize that too. Some people, once they realize that, they understand a lot better how things can become overgrown, become out of balance, become too long because it never had the opportunity to wear down. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And I don't know if you've encountered this, but when I've talked to a variety of local veterinarians, it seems like incisor balancing and incisor work is like a controversial topic. It's like some 
feel really um, like up in arms about it. <laughs> and like this is even, you know, veterinarians and other, you know, lay dentists too have heard varying opinions about how they feel about it. Do you have any opinion on uh, why that might be controversial? I definitely do have a insight into that. That is that we have not had enough education and exposure and study and research on what equine dentistry is able to accomplish. And so when I'm in veterinary school, I'm simply not going to get that information. It's not that the information is not out there. It's that it's not being integrated into the standard veterinary education. And depending on where you go to equine dental school, it's also not incorporated into their standard line of dental care topics. So when you realize that it's simply not out there in enough depth and with enough specificity that the people involved with equine dental care are on the ignorant side of that equation. And that means that we just don't know. If, if you don't know about something, I'm certainly not going to blame you for not doing what I think could be done. I mean, if we know better, we do better. If somebody is practicing a certain technique or doing it a certain way, it's because that's what they've been practicing. That's what they've been taught. That's what that's their go-to way of doing things. And it doesn't matter if it's dental care or hoof care or child care or anything, right? It's how we do what we do. So that's the reason that this is a slow but sure evolution coming around into not only recognizing the problem, because if I ask nine out of 10 veterinarians to look at this picture of this horse's mouth and tell me what they see, most of them are not going to pick up on what I recognize as a deformity. And then you, you, you start to point it out. And sometimes it's like deer in the headlights look. Sometimes it's like, oh, okay, I didn't really see that. And then we get into the human ego part of it. Once the information is there, what are people going to do with it? Are they going to dismiss it? Because there's a lot of professional dismissiveness around hoof care, dental care, holistic equine care, herbal medicine, naturopathic approaches. And it's too easy. It's easy and it's also too easy to just dismiss it out of sight, out of mind. That way you don't have to discuss it, debate it. And so that happens a lot. And when that happens, I uh, anymore easily just direct my attention to where I am, where I do have some ears, where I do have some audience, because there's so much of that now. Uh, we want to talk to people who are interested in knowing, not the people that we have to convince, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I, uh, I've i read your book, Insight to Equus, which is really great. And you spend a whole ton of time in it talking about like what you're saying, why you approach dental work the way you do, different issues that you see from lack of correct dental work. And you spend a lot of time talking about pathology and issues that it causes. So can you talk a little bit about some of the, you know, sort of side effects you see from not balancing incisors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really interesting. It's a whole progression of changes that start and lead to the next weak spot or the next, the next domino to fall, for example. Uh, let's, let's think about how this might start because... When horses are young and they have their baby teeth come in, those are deciduous teeth or teeth that are going to come in and fall out and be replaced by permanent teeth. It's the permanent teeth that have the huge long roots and are going to keep growing and keep coming in. And they're the ones that need the appropriate amount of abrasion and wear. And so usually by around age five, you have a horse that has a full set of permanent teeth no more baby teeth then within one to two years i can start to show you how they're becoming deformed and again why because of lack of grazing and lack of movement now the lack of movement part i didn't mention yet but i have a pretty strong operating theory 
that horses that actually physically move more have better looking incisors because when horses are going along and moving about or running about, turning corners, jumping, dipping, diving, playing, bucking, they hold their front incisors in a centered position and there's little micro movements going on. The back teeth are not so much in occlusion, which means in contact, but the front teeth or incisors are. And imagine the thousands and thousands of little micro movements in side to side and front to back, very importantly, anterior to posterior, front to back, movements that can happen with incisors coming together during physical movement. So that's that. Now back to lack of grazing. You're not ripping and tearing. You throw out that hay or they go out to eat the green grass, which is not abrasive, and they can practically lap that up with their lips, right? They pick it up with their lips. It goes right past their front teeth to the back teeth. The front teeth did nothing in that, not really. And so there was no wear or abrasion. But they are chewing with their back teeth. You can hear it. You can see them rotating their jaw both ways, and you can hear it crunch, crunch, crunch. So there is some wear happening with the chewing teeth, the premolars and molars, or cheek teeth as we call them. And there is some wear happening back there, but very little wear happening with the incisors. Uh Aha. So now, relative to the front teeth, you have more wear and abrasion with the chewing teeth. So relative to the chewing teeth, your incisors are what? What's happening? They're getting longer and longer and more and more out of balance relative to their chewing teeth. Now, When you have an opportunity to look at a skull or get my book and look at these pictures or get some continuing education on dentistry, look at how the jaw goes side to side and comes into occlusion with the back teeth and what happens with the front teeth. Very interesting thing here, and I I tried to show this in sequential pictures in the book because once you get this, you can see what's happening with incisors that get too long and it's that's this is what happens they physically interfere with the back teeth coming into full and proper occlusion and movement because of their physical overgrowth and steep angle or presence of incisor hooks etc so it's a physical biomechanical blockage to proper mastication Now, what happens after that? They have to try hard. Horses love to eat. I mean, come on, we got to get this food. We got to, I got to chew this. I mean, talk about oral fixation in a creature. Horses are it. They have their mouth on everything. They got it on us and our hair, you know, what we got there in your pocket, uh, on the ground, on the post, in the water, swishing around, very oral. So if something's not right, they're going to really put a lot of effort into chewing harder. And you will see horses get overdeveloped muscles in their head, masseter muscle, temporalis muscle, that are trying very hard to get that chewing satisfaction going, even though their front teeth are starting to interfere with that. And pretty soon, they start to flatten their back teeth. They, have, they reduce the molar table angle in the, of the back teeth, and that's a little bit of a teaser for somebody who wants to really think about how that might happen but i see that with monotonous regularity Uh, horses back teeth should sit at an angle inside their head not be flat top to bottom they develop sharper than normal points i think this is because they get into a habit of a transverse chewing side to side instead of circular the blockage the biomechanical blockage of the front teeth very often forces them into transverse or side-to-side chewing. And imagine just sharpening your knife, you know, swipe after swipe after swipe. It, it draws that point out, draws it out. It's sharper and sharper. Horses that chew more appropriately, naturally, will develop some points, but they're not very sharp. They certainly don't lacerate their cheeks or cause sores or stuff like that. Okay, and then what happens after that? Now we're trying harder to chew. Now it's getting our teeth flattened and too sharp and it starts to be uncomfortable. 
And that's why I press really hard, press, press, press. And where's that pressure now? Pressure increases on the incisors and the temporomandibular joints, TMJ for short. You see a lot of compressive type of pain and disability with TMJs and horses. And you can oftentimes get them to tattle on themselves when they have this by palpating just under their ears, uh, just in front of their throat latch. The classic response is to throw the head up or tuck the chin. They overcollect and they throw their head up very much on reflex. This is the way they protect themselves from even more injury, more compression. By collecting their pole and overarching, they can draw their mandible, which is the jaw, the lower part of the skull, the jaw. They, they pull it back. They retract it. That way they can escape from some of this biomechanical blockage happening with the incisors. Okay, so when they do that and they start to get defensive and they get high-headed and they get over-collected and they get really rigid and really tight through their pole, now how does that affect posture? Well, I'll tell you for sure that it affects it adversely, negatively. They become stiff in their whole body. Whole body stiffness in horses is it seems like it's epidemic. I, I think part of the reason is dentistry, part is hoof care, part is diet, of course, mineral balance. But what's happening with this behavior of high-headedness and overarching through their pole is they're escaping the deformity of their incisors. And now their back teeth are not lining up. It's like, oh, great. So now the lower teeth, the lower chewing teeth are set a little bit further back than the top teeth. So they're not meeting evenly top to bottom. And they develop overgrowths on the upper premolar and lower rear molars of their whole dental arcade. This is absolutely epidemic. Uh, I can look in a horse's mouth and probably more than half the time see upper premolar hooks and lower molar ramps in the very back of their mouth. Now, how would you like to try to go over that jump or make that turn? Or how would you like to extend your head forward as your hooks and ramps interfere along with your incisors? So now you have added deformity. Started with the incisor, now you have chewing teeth deformity and biomechanical blockage. And now somebody's like, God dang it, you, you, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to extend here and collect here and you're supposed to jump this way. And so I'm going to tie your head down or I'm going to put a flash band on you or we're going to go to a different bit. Or, and I'll tell you what, some of these horses get so painful and frustrated out of their mind that they turn into monsters. Some of them are very compliant, as you know, uh, horses being the creatures they are. They, they put up with so much. But some of these will get to the point where they can cause people deadly injuries from exploding or, you know, they're just trying to protect themselves or they're looking for the answer. And I can't go this way and I can't go this way. So how about I go straight up and over backwards? I've seen that happen way too many times. It, it just scares the life out of me. I actually have a little bit of PTSD because of that. It not only has happened to me as a, at a young age, but I've observed people pulling on horses and go over backwards and really get hurt. So uh, what happens from there? We talk about how being able to hold your head and your jaw freely and have freedom of movement with your pole and your jaw uh, allows for freedom of movement in the rest of the body. And why is that? Another teaser for somebody who really wants to get into this is, is look up myofascial kinetic lines. These are fascial planes that exist through the jaws, over the pole, down through the back, down through the hamstrings, through the suspensory apparatus, back up through the extensor tendons, through the abdominal muscles, to the pectorals, up the ventral neck muscles, back up to the jaw. And they go forward and back and on the side of the horse and they spiral around. And you can have combinations of all these things that are getting tight on one side and compressed on the other. And horses that are bracing one way and not the other because they're trying to balance themselves with their deformities in their head. And okay, so you get the point where I'm going with mm -hmm. 
a, a domino effect here, how right. it starts with one thing and one thing else. Okay, so what do we do to turn some of that around? We have to start to recognize the deformities when they're subtle. You know, to me, they're not subtle. I mean, you can look at a hoof and say with 100% assuredness, that horse has something in their diet that is causing a problem. Or that horse right there has a contracted heel and a frog that's diseased. That, that's not subtle to you, right. but there's a ton that look at that every day and they don't, they don't think twice about, that's just the way horses are. It's like, no, that's not, that's not acceptable. That's disease. That's deformity. So it, to me, in my eyes, looking at horses' teeth anymore, the subtleties speak volumes. And we got to start recognizing that. And there's tons of good pictures in the book. And also on my Facebook page, if you want to see a few little differences in horse teeth pictures, uh, to start to educate your eyes. you got to train your eyes to see this stuff. And then you're like, wow. Yeah, I see it. I see it. I see it. And, and then you're off and rolling. Yeah. And, and obviously, like you're saying, the teeth affect so much of the body that it's not a stretch for us to realize that they affect the feet too. And that's actually how I originally even found out about you is because of all the work that you've done on the correlation between teeth and the hoof. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what you see between imbalanced teeth and imbalanced feet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is... Uh... This is really interesting stuff, uh, and it's also very well known in human medicine, especially with certain chiropractic circles. If you talk to somebody who knows about TMJ balance and dental balance in people and how it affects their movement, they will fill your ears for a long time. So this is not a new thing in in circles of biomechanics and and with animals, because human animals have had this worked out for a while and still learning too. But when I started to make documented notes on the horses I was seeing, I got up to around 11 to 1200 horses on my spreadsheet. And I was keeping track of all of these measurements of incisors, angle, length, whether or not they were straight or skewed, which means slanted. For so example, when you part the lips and you're looking right in the front, you got your head right in front of the horse where they can barely see you right mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're looking you're looking at those teeth head on they should be straight straight line side to side not a slant so that that's what i mean by a skew uh, some dentists call that a wedge an incisor wedge just so you know what that means when you hear that and i was keeping track of all these things and given my history of being obsessed with hooves like you are I was trimming these horses and doing their teeth and doing their whole annual horse health makeover every time I was going to see them every year. And all of a sudden, uh, there was one case in particular where I noticed that every horse that I had been trimming and then doing their teeth, I was noticing a correlation in balance in their mouth, whether it was from a previous lameness or a previous injury or a habit or a way of standing or a posture or something in the environment that was causing the horse to be off balance, uh, whether it was the barn design, where the water was, the slope of the hill, the slope of the stall, where horses camped out. Horses have their favorite places where they stand and that ground is not level or it has a certain slope to it or the feeding area is also not quite balanced, or it's just monotonous for years. Like they, this is where I feed my horse in this corner right here all the time. This is where they stand for, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours while they eat in this certain posture. Right. And I thought, wow, look at the angle of these incisors and look at the feet on this horse. And it was heel height. That was the first indication it's, it's a lot more now but the first thing was heel height because next time you're standing next to your horse just put your hand up on their withers and rock them side to side and watch their fetlocks and watch their legs pump up and down what happens when you push your horse away from you you got your hand up on their withers and you push them away from you a little bit watch the front leg that's next to you 
you'll see that fetlock come up. Now pull them towards you a little bit. Not so much that they take a step, but just pull them a little bit. Now what happens to that fetlock? It pushes down. What is that? That's less and more heel pressure constantly. More and less heel pressure. Now how does that affect hoof wear? If a horse walks around on their toes, what happens? They wear their toes down. What happens to a horse that has a crooked leg and it comes in kind of wonky down towards the ground? They wear off that one side of their foot constantly and end up with a medial lateral imbalance. Uh, what happens to heel sore horses? They don't like to use their heels. Their heels tend to get longer and they tend to crush their toes. Uh, what happens to horses that are chronically laminitic that lean back on their heels? Uh, they tend to crush their heels and they tend to get long toes that extend out in front of them, which ends up, you know, causing hyperextensive sorts of uh, pain and pressure and that we try to manage. So these are all things that you already know as a trimmer or you already appreciate with balance. And the question I was asking myself is why is it showing up in their mouth with this consistency? Because the horses with the left front heel that's higher were chewing away from that side. They were chewing towards their front leg that feels better. And at first I would say, when I found this out, that they were chewing towards their front leg with the lower heel, but that's not, that's not accurate. What's more accurate now is to say that horses like to chew in the direction of their more comfortable front leg. And when it comes to hind legs, it usually goes on a diagonal if you understand balance across the diagonal. So, wow, this, this was really blowing my mind because now I was playing a game with myself because I thought maybe it's coincidence. So I had to start testing myself. Before I, I meet a new horse, I watch them move. I watch them turn both ways, back up, forward, backward, turn circles. I look at their feet and then make a note. What am I going to see in their mouth? What kind of an angle am I going to see with their incisors? Is it going to be skewed? Is it going to be a slant? Is it going to be an overjet or an underjet? In other words, are their are their incisors going to meet correctly, or are they going to be off? And which way? And eighty five percent of the time, I was right. And and to this day, if I see a horse I haven't seen before and I see an asymmetry with especially their front feet, very common, I can tell you and be right 80 to 85% of the time with regards to how their teeth are going to look. Now that's pretty good odds. I'm, I'm going to win big in Vegas if, mm -hmm. if I got those kind of odds, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, why is that? And so we had to study, okay, what's the connection? Well, it's right back to those myofascial kinetic lines and it's right back to body balance and gravity. You can do this with yourself, just sway back and forth side to side and you'll feel your head on a little pedestal up there like a chicken just going back and forth and your your jaw will swing a little bit and so there's there's simple effects just as simple as that where the jaw will fall downhill because of leaning one way but probably over time it's more important that these myofascial kinetic lines and fascial tension and horses that are bracing to compensate for imbalance it gets worse and worse. It's a vicious cycle. Once they're off balance and they start to brace themselves, then it will keep going downhill and, and get a worse imbalance, especially the ones that are not moving enough. Can't underemphasize how damaging it is for horses to stand around, but that might be a different discussion. <laughs> yeah. Now, after Dr. Teske mentioned movement, we move on to another subject, but I didn't want to just gloss over that. I think that movement is incredibly important for horses, for their hoof health, their body health, and just their mental health. So if you want to hear more about that, you can go back to some of my previous podcast episodes, like one with Nick and Relitza Hill and Stephen Lee and Krista Jones to hear more about movement and how it affects the body and the hoof. Yeah, and you actually talked a bit about how, obviously, you've been looking at these correlations for a really long time. And um, in your book, you have uh, outlined the study that you did with over a thousand horses and looking at so many different factors in their teeth and their feet and, you know, between across different breeds and uh -huh. 
And uh, obviously, I don't want to give away too much. I think that everybody should buy the book and check it out and look at those findings because they're really interesting. Um, But just to give people a little bit of a sneak peek, do you have one finding that was the most surprising to you? Mm, There are a bunch of interesting findings, but one that kind of came up when you asked that was the difference between the sexes of the horses, meaning the mares, the females, and the geldings or stallions. Uh, Now, probably similar to you and most people in this country, when we go to see a horse and it's a male, it's been gelded. It's a castrated stallion. I do have a number of stallions I take care of, but the number of geldings is far and away just 95 plus percent of all the male horses are gelded. And I found out that they have a higher incidence of specific incisor deformities than their female counterparts, even the ones that they're living with. So I thought, is there something about not having testosterone that helps your (laughs) teeth stay straight or keeps them from getting deformed or or what is that so i think what i have come up with at this point is back to movement because not every gelding is a a dull horse but compared to a stallion they sure are yeah if you've ever had time to spend uh, quality time with stallions uh, come back and tell me how much energy they emote versus most geldings it's an alarming difference huge amount of difference in their posture in their willingness to move in their quality of movement and then you look at female or mares uh, uh, female horses and i love riding mares over geldings if i had a choice simply because given as a population they have a quality of movement and a fire and a spirit that I get along with. Uh, I know a lot of people like to have geldings because they don't want that drama, right? They don't want all that fire. But interesting discussions we could have about what is a gelding? What What is that? It, um, because it's not 100% a horse in in my mind anymore. It's, it's, it's very much uh, altered and different. And it's by design. I mean, we we did it horses male horses gonads are very convenient to remove uh, as well as other animals so we just castrate them all and and we enjoy them not being so much drama and having so many babies around and but the consequences of that seem to translate through less movement less quality of movement and a statistically higher level of incisor deformity versus female horses so there you go that's so interesting yeah i know i do remember you talking a bit about stallions in your book too Mm -hmm. so this is kind of an odd question um but what practices do you suggest that people incorporate to allow better balanced tooth wear in between dental work because obviously you know same with hoof care we know that there are things that we can do to help you know, keep things more aligned and healthy. Um, Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you had suggestions for that. Yeah, great question. Uh, So as a trimmer, I bet you have probably recommended somebody put in a track with a little bit of gravel here and there, maybe. Yep. Or or, uh, (laughs) maybe you said, hey, how about putting down a little bit of a rail here, rail that make them actually lift their feet and step over something instead of being a flatlander, right? Yeah. Um, or okay so let's translate that to dental care now a more holistic dental care approach how about some different types of feed some different kinds of grass some different lengths uh, now if you're not able to get that i want you to put it into a hay net or a hay bag and i like the ones that don't have all the knots sticking up yeah. the ones that are made out of the flat fishing net. They do a really good job at slowing the horse down when they're eating. And what they have to do is grab the little bits of hay with what? Their front teeth. Aha. 
They can't just do it with their lips if the holes are small enough. So you want a one inch or one and a half inch openings in your hay net and the kinds without the knots, if possible, don't get rid of the ones you have. But the next time you have to replace them, maybe look for ones that are flat. And they grab that with their front teeth. And I noticed that they're getting a little bit aware. It's almost like a trimmer when you have instructed somebody because you gave them your old rasp and you said, I want you to take off two millimeters of this toe from 10 to two, because every time I come back, this toe is running away. And it would be so great if when I come back in four or six weeks that this toe is not that long. So similar idea with me doing teeth, people that go with the hay nets, I'm having to do about half or less of the amount of incisor adjustment if they're using hay nets. So huge. Uh, and not to mention that hay nets are also really good for metabolic uh, curves, uh, you know, getting that insulin curve to not be so such a roller coaster, uh, keeping their gut happier, keeping their mind happier, their mouth, keeping their mouth working, that oral fixation going, keep that happier. So I love hay nets uh, for the most part. Uh, what else for teeth? Back to movement. Again, the more mileage a horse is putting on, the better their teeth stay balanced uh, with regards to their incisor balance, that is. And I think that also is because of less body stiffness. Remember I was saying about how stiff horses retract their jaw or their mandible and they hold their lower jaw too far back and that leads to body stiffness? Right. Well, horses that move more and exercise more and do their aerobics are less stiff horses. Now, if you're less stiff in your body, you're, you're coming back into that head and that TMJ area and that part of the body with that loosening up effect also. And so now by exercising, you are staying more loose in your pole and your head and your, your jaw, especially after I've fixed the teeth. It's your perfect opportunity to hit the trail or do those exercises or get out there and play with the horses and get them to romp around and, and be horses and stay loose, you know, keep it loose, guys. Don't stand around and get stiff. Horses that stand around and get stiff at their posture, this ends up going down the wrong path to more deformities in their feet and their body and their metabolism and their teeth and all that. So exercise for sure. Hay nets, types of hay, uh, abrasive forage. Graze when you can. If you can go out, take your horse out and let them graze on something, that's great. Let them chew on some bark. Get some logs of a safe kind of a tree that's not toxic and throw those logs into their habitat and let them chew on those logs like beavers. We don't want them to be cribbers, but horses like to chew on stuff. Uh, so old branches, logs, it's better than them chewing the barn down or mm -hmm. cribbing on the fence. You know, give them logs and big branches to chew on. Uh, and definitely add a vertical dimension to your horse habitat. And that means rails. That means a cavaletti type. They got to step over this. They got to turn this way. They got to go up over this hump of dirt that you put. Because I can pick out the flatland horses with their posture and their, the way their body looks versus the horses that exercise up and down hills or over little jumps or have more vertical dimension to their life. They have certain muscle patterns and certain way they hold themselves if they're a flatlander versus uh, not. So try to add that to your horse habitat, a vertical dimension. Yeah, I think this is all so great. Yeah, that was a, that was a fun time getting together with you and you know, we didn't have to get dressed up fancy or anything. <laughs> we could just be ourselves and have a good discussion. And that was fun. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Cause I know it's like an hour of your time and you have like two new babies and, um, yeah. so <laughs> thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Thanks Alicia. Awesome. And uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. You too. And have a great rest of your day. Okay. You too. Bye.